Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Claire Broughton, and um, I'm here today to talk about Chapter 1 on Foundations of Criminal Law for uh, Criminal Law Class. So when we talk about criminal law, we're actually talking about uh, two things. We're, we're actually um, talking about substantive criminal law or procedural criminal law. There's a difference between the two concepts. Substantive criminal law um, deals with definitions of crimes and their penalties, whereas procedural criminal law deals with the implementation of criminal sanction through the laws of arrest, search, seizure, and confessions and the courtroom rules of evidence. So procedural criminal law encompasses uh, the processes and the rules from the initial point of contact of the offender with the criminal justice system. So for example, when he's, he or she is arrested by a police officer up until the point that person is charged before the courts. And um, when, when he or she goes through the court processes, and then is transferred over to the corrections and then either paroled or probation. Now you'll ask, why is it important to study criminal law? I'll give you two examples of why ex exactly you need to know, um, you know, what actions are crime and what actions are not criminal. So let's take this uh, case of the MacBook Pro versus Acer. Now let's pretend that you and a friend are studying together at the library. You have a MacBook Pro and she has an Acer laptop. Both of you have identical laptop computer bags, however. So you carpool with her and she drives towards the dorm where both of you live. As you leave her car, you grab the nearest laptop bag. The next afternoon, you discover that you grabbed the wrong laptop bag. You break into her separate dorm room, which is locked, and retrieve your own computer. Now, is this burglary? What do you think? If you didn't know burglary, you wouldn't know whether or not you committed the crime in this case. So let's break this case down. First, okay, so you broke into our separate dorm room and the dorm room is locked. So is there breaking and entering? Yes, right? But what do you do inside? Have you committed theft? No, right? Because you're trying to retrieve your own computer. It's yours, it's not hers, you just wanted to Correct the mistake by you know, swapping it. Now, this probably would not be burglary under common law. Um, under Texas law, we need to look at the definition of burglary. Burglary under the Texas Penal Code is breaking and entering into a building or dwelling house with the intent to commit theft, felony, or assault inside. So you have to have the intent at the mo moment you break and enter you, um, that particular um, location. In this case, as I mentioned, you don't have the intent to commit theft because what you are retrieving is your own property. So hence, you're not liable for burglary. Do you see why it's important to know um, the law on um, the law on crime? Okay. The second case is the case of the mistaken jacket. Okay. So let's pretend you and your friend are having dinner in a local restaurant. You both have identical coats that you both place in the coat rack at the entrance of the restaurant. Yours, however, has a small tear at the right sleeve. As you both leave the restaurant, you grab one of the coats. While in your dorm room, you notice that the coat you grabbed does not have a small tear at the right sleeve. You decide to keep it anyway. Are you liable for theft when you grab the coat? How about when you um, decide to keep it? So let's break this down. What happened? When you grab the coat, you grab the wrong coat. Grab your friend's coat instead of your own coat, okay? Uh, so was it your intent to deprive the owner of the, her, his or her coat? Or was it just a mistake or an accident? When we look at the law on theft, theft is basically appropriating the property of another with the intent to deprive that person of his or her property. So the intent must be at the mo moment that you grab the coat, okay? So here, probably, it wouldn't be theft because when you grab the coat, you thought it was yours, right? Now, are you liable for theft when you decide to keep it? I'll leave you to think about that, ponder it on your own. So criminal law varies from state to state. There are 50 penal codes plus a separate code for the District of Columbia. 
a code for the armed forces, and a code for the federal government. In total, there are 53 criminal codes and more than 50 definitions of crimes such as murder, larceny, robbery, rape, and theft. The Texas Penal Code is a good code because it is based on the model penal code that was drafted by the American Law Institute. Okay? The State Bar Texas Committee in 1965 drafted the Texas Penal Code. It was revised in 1994. Now let's look at the primary attributes of crime. What is crime? Crime or misdemeanor is an act committed or omitted in violation of a public law, either forbidding or commanding it. So this is the definition of Sir William Blackstone, who is a scholar of English criminal common law. When we say that crime is an act committed, it means there has to be an overt act, okay? It's an affirmative action that is visible in the outside world. However, that act can either be a physical act or a verbal act. Or omitted, a crime is a, an act omitted. So you'll see that failure to act in certain instances are also considered as crimes. A second definition of crime is that it is any social harm defined and made punishable by law. The American Law Institute's model penal code has four elements. It is conduct that unjustifiably and inexcusably, inexcusably inflicts or threatens substantial harm to individual or public interests. Okay. Now Dowling in his book has um, four primary attributes of crime. First, the government defines the illegal conduct. Second, the government is a victim. Third, the government prosecutes the case. And fourth, judgment is payable to the government. Now, the first attribute of crime is that it is illegal conduct defined by the government. What does this mean? Who is the government? Okay. So in, um, in, the, in law schools, legal academics and students are often taught certain Latin maxims. And the Latin maxim for this particular um, case is nullum crimen nulla pina sine lige, meaning there is no crime without a law defining it, okay? I'll give you an example. On July 4th evening at around 9 p.m., you hold a party at your apartment complex. Let's assume uh, the pandemic is already over so that you're holding a party. Um, so your friends are having fun and hanging out by the swimming pool, playing music, drinking beer, and lighting some fireworks. Uh, the apartment manager posted house rules as part of the lease, bearing alcohol and fireworks at pools, poolside or limiting hours for the use of the pool. Was a crime committed? Okay, well, it depends, okay? If there is an unreasonable level of noise, it could be disorderly conduct. If um, they're underage, uh, if some of your friends are underage, you could be violating um, laws on drinking, underage drinking. If um, you're, if some people, some of your friends are drunk in public, and they are could be a nuisance or a danger to themselves or others, could be public intoxication. Okay, but assuming that the police officer who was called to the scene found that the audio player was not too loud, and you and your friends are all over the age of twenty one, what do you think? Is this a crime? No, because here there is no law barring it. Nothing um, was prohibited. It nothing. Um, not, none of the actions violated criminal law. The fact that the apartment manager posted the house rules, okay, barring alcohol or fireworks, does not make the act criminal because an apartment manager is not government. Okay, let's look at the second case. An eight-year-old, uh, a neighbor told an eight-year-old boy and his friend not to play behind the building because, because it was dangerous. The boy answered belligerently, in a minute. Losing patience, the neighbor said, no, not in a minute. Get out of there now. A few days later, he broke into her house, pulled the goldfish out of its bowl, chopped it into little pieces with a steak knife, and smeared it all over the counter. Okay? Then he walked into the bathroom, plugged in a curling iron, and clamped it into a towel. Was a crime committed? What do you think? What? Uh, there are possible options. Did the boy commit 
stress. Uh, did, the, the, did the boy commit burglary? Again, the definition of burglary is breaking and entering into a building or dwelling house with the intent to commit theft. Okay, theft, felony, or assault inside. So here, would chopping the goldfish in, uh, into little pieces would it constitute theft because you deprive the owner of his or her property? How about criminal trespass? If you don't want to charge the boy with a criminal trespass, then uh, with a burglary, then probably it could be criminal trespass because of breaking and entering without consent. Now, the problem here is that we're talking about an eight-year-old boy. So you would have to look at the age of criminal liability, okay? Because minority, if you're below a certain age, you could not actually be criminally liable. The second attribute of crime is that the government is the victim of crime. And you can see this in the charging charging decisions. So when the prosecutor um, makes a charge, uh, charge against the offender or if um, a case is filed, it's the government of the state or the federal government that is the prosecutor. Okay, so example, state of Texas versus show. It's Texas who is the victim of the crime, so it's Texas that's suing. U.S. versus Joe, if it's a federal um, federal offense. Texas constitutions and statutes, in fact, require that all legal documents, ranging from charge complaints to indictments, conclude with a specific phrase against the peace and dignity of the state. So is the public rep represented by its government? Who is the offended party? Um, one evidence that the government is a victim of the crime is that the government can continue to prosecute the case even without a missing or reluctant complainant. So the government, the third attribute is that the government prosecutes the case. So it's a prosecutor who is a government employee who decides whether or not to bring charges against the offender. In Texas, the district attorneys and county attorneys are popularly elected and accountable to the electorate. As I mentioned, they have discretion on whether or not to charge, what specific criminal charges to file, who to prosecute and whether to enter into a plea bargain. And in fact, the government also pays the costs of investigation and prosecution, but court costs are paid by the accused. The fourth attribute of crime is that judgment is payable to the government. So whatever is recovered in the crime um, within the criminal action, for example, fines or penalties, they are given and payable directly to the government and society. The, the victim does not keep any. Okay. So the offended party must file a civil case in court to collect damages. This is not true in other cases. So in the US, the civil and criminal case is separate. Okay, they're not automatically merged. In some countries, the criminal and civil cases are merged unless you make an express reservation to file a separate civil case. So for example, in the Philippines, if you file a criminal case, a civil case is automatically merged in the criminal case. So a uh, court, a, a judge in a criminal case would also rule on the fines payable directly to the victim or the offended party because it's directly merged. So what is the relationship be between criminal and civil law? Criminal offense involves injury to persons or damage to property, okay? But it can also serve as a basis for a lawsuit. The burden of proof is different in both cases. In criminal case, it's beyond reasonable doubt. While as in civil case, it's preponderance of evidence. You'll know about more about this in your courts and criminal procedure classes. What is the relationship between criminal and civil law again? Well, um, as I mentioned, you can file civil, civil suits arising from a criminal case or regardless of the disposition of the criminal case. However, suits, civil suits are relatively rare because criminal offenders lack their financial resources to pay the monetary judgment in civil cases. There are exceptions, however, for example, white collar crimes, corporate crimes, wherein the offender have the money to settle and pay damages to the offended party and the victim in a separate civil case. And then minor traffic offender, uh, van offenders, offender violations, Usually, monetary damages can be um, obtained, especially if there's an insurance, automobile insurance. 
So let's look at some examples of civil lawsuits arising from criminal acts. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in um, 1994, uh, O.J. Simpson was uh, accused okay, of murdering his wife, ex-wife, Nicole Simpson, and her acquaintance, Ron, Ron Goldman. This was in the case of State of California versus Orental. The court acquitted, the jury acquitted him, okay, but he was civilly sued by the estate of his ex-wife and the parents of the deceased friend for the tort of wrongful death. In the civil action that followed, the jury, civil jury awarded the victim's families $33.5 million in damages. It was renewed in court in 2015 and extended through 2025. The judgment has grown to about you know, 58, 58 million, but O.J. Simpson um, is still contesting it in court and doesn't want to pay it. According to a Nevada court filing from Fred Goldman, um, the parents of the deceased, in uh, February of this year, 2021, Simpson has paid close to 133,000 of the settlement, but still owes the family more than $50 million. So you can see that even if you um, succeed in a civil case, sometimes it's difficult to actually um, enforce the decision, especially if the offender is reluctant to pay the damages. Another example was the Kobe Bryant case. So in 2003, he was charged with sexual assault of a 19-year-old employee at the Lodge and Spa at Cordillera, which is a hotel in Edwards, Colorado. Charges were dropped, but Bryant may have settled the civil suit in an estimated amount of 2.5 million damages. Now let's look at the sources of, sources of criminal law. There are several sources of criminal law. First, the common law of England, which is basically custom and case law, monarchical decrees and parliamentary enactments. The common law of England uh, follows the doctrine of stare decisis or legal precedent, meaning that to ensure uniformity of uh, decisions in certain cases and predictability of outcomes, um, judges decided to rely on cases based on prior similar decisions. So if, for example, if there are two cases with the same facts, and one was decided earlier, the judge of the latter case would rule similarly as a judge of the prior case. Let's look at um, how stare decisis is defined. I want you to watch.
So that explains the concept of stereocysis. So what are the sources of criminal law? In the 13th century, um, with the establishment of, parliament, establishment of parliament, they issued decrees. Many states after 1776 adapted common law crimes as their penal code, uh, initially leaving the definitions of crimes in their unwritten form. For example, uh, under common law, burglary is entering and breaking a private dwelling at nighttime for the purposes of committing theft or a felony therein. Okay. With respect to how states um, consider or interpret common law, some states still recognize common law crimes that don't conflict with written statutes. In these states, the violation of common law is considered a misdemeanor. An example would be Florida. In other states, they rely on statutory crimes, meaning crimes enacted in statutes or codes, but they use the common law to provide definitions for the elements of these crimes. An example would be North Carolina. Other states such as Texas by statute abolished common law crimes. And finally, the federal government does not enforce unwritten law, common law crimes. Um, other sources of common law are laws of other countries. For example, for Texas or uh, for Texas, it would be Spain and Mexico. In fact, the territorial jurisdiction of Texas is based on the Spanish law of three leagues. So instead of the usual three mile limit for coastal states, meaning that for coastal states, their jurisdiction extends three miles, three nautical miles beyond the high tide line of their shore into the waters, um, adjacent waters. In Texas, our, ju our jurisdiction extends into the Gulf of Mexico for about three leagues, okay? And not the common law three mile limit. So this is based on Spanish law. How long exactly is three leagues? It's 10.35 miles. So it's not just three miles, but Texas jurisdiction extends 10.35 miles, okay? Um, in the Southeast, this is huge. This is, a good, um, this is good for Texas because then it can enforce its laws beyond the three mile limit. So what exactly is uh, the codification movement? The codification movement is basically um, the act of legislature in compiling all common laws and various various statutes and rulings into one specific code. So the primary source of codes and statutes is the Texas legislature. Let's look at this. This video provides uh, gives an explanation of the Texas legislature.
So let's go back to um, PowerPoint. So it's the current speaker of the house uh, in Texas is Matthew McDade Fellon. Let's look at the powers of the Texas legislature. The Texas constitution grants to the Texas legislature the power to enact any law on any subject or in any field that is not expressly denied to it. This is the doctrine of preemption. Okay, so under um, under the Texas Penal Code, it has the authority to define crimes and penalties that are reasonably related to the needs of society and um, general welfare of the public. The effectivity of the the effectivity of the uh, law enacted by the Texas Legislature is September one of the same year, sometimes January one of the following year, but it is effective immediately if the legislature finds that an emergency exists. So, what are examples of statutory enactments? You have the Texas Penal Code, you have the Texas Transportation Code, you for motor vehicle laws. For drug laws, they are enacted in the Texas Health and Safety Code. For hunting and fishing statutes, it's in the Texas Parks and Wildlife Code. There are also municipal ordinances. In Texas, there are 300 cities that are authorized to enact penal ordinances, and they are also authorized to enact um, to impose jail terms and fines up to $500 for failure to follow these ordinances. An example would be animal control laws and anti-fireworks laws. However, because of the principle of double jeopardy, the offender cannot be prosecuted under both state law and city ordinance. Other sources of criminal law are the uniform laws, such as traffic laws and anti-narcotic laws, and the federal criminal law, which is 18 USC, for example, section 1341, section 1343. The US Constitution okay, provides that Congress has the power to create crimes limited to areas of inherent federal interest, such as espionage, use of mail to commit fraud, crimes committed on federal property, such as District of Columbia and Indian reservations, and criminal conduct that involves interstate or foreign activity. Examples would be money laundering laws, pyramid or Ponzi schemes, and human trafficking. All of these crimes, all of these actions transcend state boundaries. An example of um, uh, crimes enacted pursuant to the U.S. Constitution's Commerce Clause, wherein it has the power to regulate interstate commerce, are the 1992 Federal Anti-Carjacking Law, wherein vehicles transported or received in interstate or foreign commerce that are involved in uh, carjacking are subject to the law. Also, the Lindbergh Law, it declares kidnapping for ransom a federal offense and it applies only when a victim is transported from one state to another. Now, when we classify crimes, we have to consider that um, on, on, the, on the extent of severity and scale, they're not all created equal. The traditional American classification of crimes is felony for the more serious or grave crimes and misdemeanor for the lighter offenses. In Texas, we classify crimes based on where the punishment is served. So a felony, a crime is a felony if it, the offense is punishable by death or incarceration in state prison, in state prison. However, the act, the crime is considered a misdemeanor if the only punishment is a monetary fine or serving time in a local county jail. Now, my question is, how about if you serve time in a state, in a state jail? Well, there's a, such a thing as a state jail felony. So in that case, it would be a felony, okay? So it's only a, mis a misdemeanor if you serve time in a county jail and not a state jail. In contrast to Texas, other states classify crimes based on length of jail time. For example, they classify felonies as those punishable by death or incarceration for a period of more than one year. And misdemeanor is punishable with fine or jail time for less than a year. Again, other types of classification of crime aside from the felony or misdemeanor would be malum in se and malum prohibitum. So what is malum in se? A malum in se is one which is naturally or inherently evil. Okay? 
So it is immoral in itself. Malum prohibitum is not evil or wrong in itself, but it is wrong because it's prohibited by law. Um, other examples, other classifications are crimes involving moral turpitude. So what is exactly moral turpitude? Moral turpitude is an act of bail, baseness, vileness, or depravity in the duties which one, person's owes, one person owes to another or to society in general, which is con contrary to the usual accepted and customary rule of right and duty, which a person should follow. An example would be murder. Okay, so there's no question that when one commits murder, it's a violation of the duty of one person to another to respect the other person's life. Consequences would be loss of occupational license, such as lawyer, nurse, doctor, deportation if resident alien, or ineligibility to hold public office. An example, um, another classification of crime would be breaches of the peace. And here you have examples as violations of public peace or order, disturbing public peace or tranquility. You have to know that under Texas law, police cannot make arrests for misdemeanors that he did not personally observe. Okay, so he has to have observed that form of misdemeanor. The exception is breach of the peace. So in breach of the peace, even if the police officer did not personally observe it, then he can still make an arrest if someone calls it in or reports it. Now let's look at the following crimes. And you have to let me know or think about, you know, wherever you are, if these crimes are malum in se or malum prohibitum. Um, murder, is it malum in se or malum prohibitum? Robbery, is it malum in se, malum prohibitum? Speeding. How about driving on a suspended or revoked license? Malicious property damage. Failure to yield right of way. Drunk driving. Tax evasion. Public drunkenness. Abortion. Now let's go to the purposes of criminal law. Texas criminal law and criminal law in general has several purposes. The first is general deterrence. So general deterrence basically tries to inform citizens about what is prohibited behavior so that they encourage them to, in, to um, refrain from committing that action because of the threat of punishment. This is based on the rational choice theory of free will. So this presupposes that you know, um, citizens, offenders have free will, they know right from wrong, and then can, they can get engaged in cost and benefit analysis. And because of the punishment, associated or attached to that criminal act, um, they feel, um, legislators feel that the criminal law would deter that offender from committing that offense. The next purpose of criminal law is specific deterrence. In contrast to trying to prevent everyone from committing that action, specific deterrence prevents that specific offender from repeating the same offense. So it's to prevent the offender from recidivism. An example um, would under an example in most uh, state statutes would be a higher conviction for the second, higher um, penalty for the second conviction of a crime. For example, Albert is convicted of burglary and is sentenced to two years in prison. After he is released, he commits another burglary and is again convicted. His second his sentence for the second conviction would be higher than the first. Another example, another purpose of criminal law is rehabilitation, to correct the behavior of a, the offender so that he or she will function appropriately in society. Um, an example would be the DWI court, so driving while intoxicated courts. In Harris County, there's one that um, rehabilitates um, drunk drivers. Then you have education and treatment programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous and counseling. Now, this is an example of a rehabilitation program um, in under Texas law, uh, it's an urban farming. And I think this is an interesting example because of the high success rate. Let me share the screen.
Aside from uh, rehabilitation, one other purpose of criminal law is retribution. So retribution is based on the adage, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, or basically just deserts. For example, capital punishment is imposed on intent to kill murder. Because you kill someone, then you know your life has to be taken. So that's a form of retribution. The goal is to punish offenders for the harm they inflicted. Another purpose of criminal law is incapacitation, which is to protect public from future harm by locking up the offender and basically throwing out the key. So what are the purposes of Texas criminal law? First, um, the purpose is to ensure public safety through general deterrence, rehabilitation, and specific deterrence. The second purpose would be to notify the public of what are criminal acts and the penalties for these acts. Third, to prescribe penalties proportionate to seriousness of the offense. So you have here the uh, principle of proportionality. You cannot impose serious penalties on non-serious crimes. Um, the fourth purpose would be would be to define what acts are not criminal. And fifth, to guide the exercise of discretion by police, courts, and corrections officials. So what are the limitations on the power to create criminal law? Obviously, you have to have public support. So um, identity theft, there's a lot of public support for it because of the harm identity theft inflicts on a huge majority of the population. Mandated say, seat belt loss and speeding, however, there seems to be um, not a lot of public support for it um, because of the perception that these are inappropriate, that these are um, uh, inappropriate or they're inconvenient and they really don't work. Some of them don't work. Another example of a legal limit would be ex post facto law. So what is an ex post facto law? An ex post facto law is a law that makes criminal an act that wasn't criminal when it was committed. So it, it's retroactive. So it makes a particular action a crime. Another example would, of an ex post facto law would be a law that increases the penalties of an action, okay, and then retroacts, it retroacts so that the increase in penalties would apply to offenders who committed the act at a time when it had a lesser penalty. So you cannot do that. You cannot make an act criminal that was innocent when done or increase the penalties for a crime okay, and make it retroactive. Um, another uh, limitation on uh, criminal law is the Bill of Rights. So the Bill of Rights are, you know, for example, the First Amendment, uh, the Second Amendment, right to bear arms, and 14th Amendment, equal protection laws. The third limitation is that the crime must involve an act, conduct, or words. So there has to be an overt manifestation in the physical word, world. You cannot be punished for what you think or for your mere status. Another legal limit would be arb um, arbitrary enforcement. There shouldn't be arbitrary enforcement um, of the crime. And crimes that the law laws, criminal laws that are vague would sometimes be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court based on the void for vagueness doctrine. In fact, in the city of Chicago versus Morales, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled um, unconstitutional a Chicago city ordinance that prohibited street gang members from loitering in any one place with no apparent purpose. The US, U.S. Supreme Court said that this was void because it was vague. What does it mean by loiter? Okay, And what does it mean that that person does not have any apparent purpose. And the court said that it fails to provide notice that ordinary people can understand because there's no definition, no common or accepted definition of no, no apparent purpose. It also encourages arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement because law enforcement officers would have, would be able to exercise total discretion in their interpretation of what it means by the fact that that person was there loitering with no apparent purpose. Another limitation would be proportionality of punishment. So the Eighth Amendment prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. So it bans both barbaric and disproportionate punishment. An example would be torture, burning at the stake, you know, um, cutting off your hands for, for theft, cutting off your head, that would be barbaric. Um, in Solemn versus Helm, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a sentence of life without parole for the seventh nonviolent felony was against the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. In this case, the offender's seventh nonviolent felony was merely passing a $100 check that bounced. So his seventh um, crime was, you know, 
bounce check and he was sentenced for life without parole. So the court said that this was not um, constitutional. In another case, Harmelin versus Michigan, um, the U.S. Supreme Court said that fixing penalties for crime is the responsibility of the legislature. So the Supreme Court would defer to the judgment of the legislative branch. The Supreme Court also held that the death sentence is disproportionate for crimes of rape and burglary, meaning that death cannot be imposed an offender on an offender who is guilty of rape and burglary. And the only time you can impose death penalty is for the crime of intent to kill murder. Another limitation would be the preemption doctrine. Preemption means that a higher level sovereign assumes total authority for the lawmaking responsibility of a particular topic. This is based on the U.S. Constitution, the Supremacy Clause, and um, the Commerce Clause, where in it, the U.S. Congress has a power to regulate interstate commerce. So um, examples of matters or subjects that are preempted, meaning that only U.S. Congress can enact laws relating to these topics, would be treason, espionage, sabotage, sale of intoxicating liquors on interstate lines. Now let's go to jurisdiction. This is also important because um, under Texas law, um, the Texas Criminal Code and Penal Code only applies within the jurisdiction of Texas. So we have to know what is the jurisdiction of Texas. Okay, beyond that, Texas law no longer applies. Now let's go back in time. In common law in England, they had the principle of territoriality. Okay, this was based this, this basically explains that um, the laws only apply within the state, within the territory of England. An exception would be a ship on high seas that flew the flag of, of the homeland. So what exactly is the high sea? The high sea is, you know, somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean and not, you know, not anywhere near the jurisdiction of any state or any country. Let's look at this case. Some crew members on a ship committed mutiny killed the captain and divided the loot among them. The ship was docked on the port of, on the harbor of Galveston port. The ship flew the flag of France. So the ship is, a citizen, is by extension a citizen of France. Which country and which state has jurisdiction, France or US? What do you think? So think about it, okay? Um, the ship is a citizen of France. If it were on the high seas, any crime committed there would be subject to the territory of France. However, where was it docked? Okay, Galveston Port. Where is Galveston Port? Is it within the jurisdiction of any state? If it was in within the jurisdiction of any state, then it would be subject to the state of that, uh, to the laws of that state. In other European countries, they follow the principle of citizenship. For example, Spain. Okay, so they say in Spain that a Spanish citizen who commits a crime anywhere in the world would be subject to Spanish laws. Now let's look at state criminal jurisdiction, um, the principle of territoriality. And this is an actual decided case in state versus all. Let's say an individual is standing in North Carol Carolina and fires a gun across state line and killed another person in Tennessee. What state has jurisdiction and why? We'll go back to this later when I talk about um, how the elements of a crime determine jurisdiction. So over time, states expanded the application of criminal statutes. For example, in People versus Boykin, a Californian who mailed a box of poison candy to a resident of Delaware was properly tried for murder in California after the Delaware recipient died. In Texas, Texas acquires jurisdiction and will implement or enforce its Texas criminal laws if any element of the offense or the result of the offense occurred within its territories. And I think this would illustrate the ex um, an example. Um, it's not here. So in Texas, if the crime was committed, if the result of the offense was committed in Texas, then it would be subject to Texas law. Now let's look at uh, this example given in the book. So for example, um, let's say uh, a person in Oklahoma, okay, holding a gun, shoot someone and kill someone, and then trans and it will shoot someone and the bullet, you know, shoot someone across the straight line, state line, and that person is in Texas. The person who died was in Texas. So the person in Oklahoma who shot the person in Texas would be liable for murder based on the laws of Texas, or um, Oklahoma could also prosecute. But Texas could definitely prosecute because death 
which is the result of the offense of murder, occurred in Texas. Is this clear? Okay. So state criminal jurisdiction extends to, sky, to the skies and territorial waters of that state. Uh, this is a map of the state of Texas. Okay. Okay. Um, we need to know Texas criminal jurisdiction. On the east, the territorial waters extend three leagues, uh, ten league, ten no, three leagues into the Gulf of Mexico, which is ten point thirty five miles, which is basically this um, portion over here. If you see the cursor, okay, so ten point five miles. So anywhere here, you're still subject to Texas criminal law, and then north, okay, and the north part with the Oklahoma. With Oklahoma State, it extends the territory of Texas extends to the south bank of the Red River. So you see this Red River, and then um, in New Mexico, the hundredth meridian. Okay, the hundredth meridian forms the boundary line, and then with Mexico, the boundary between the boundary between Mexico and Texas. It extends up to the middle, okay, the center of the Rio Grande River. So it's not the, it's not to the outer, to the outermost shore of the Rio Grande River, but only to the center, because Mexico would own the center, the other center of the Mexico, of the Rio Grande River. Now let's look at this. Um, Section 1.04A1 states that conduct or result that is an element of the offense Okay, so Texas criminal law grants jurisdiction to Texas if the conduct or result that is an element of the offense occurs inside the state. So this simply means that if any element of the offense or if the result of the offense occurs within Texas, Texas law governs. So let's look at this um, case. Mutt and Jeff became involved in a barroom fight in Oklahoma. Mutt stabs Jeff with a knife. Jeff is rushed to the nearest hospital which is across state line in Texas. Jeff dies in Texas. Does Texas have criminal jurisdiction to prosecute Mutt for homicide? Why? So think about what I explained a while ago with respect to Texas criminal jurisdiction. Note that section 1.04B states that if the body of a criminal homicide victim is found in Texas, it is presumed that death occurred in Texas. So again, think about whether or not Texas has criminal jurisdiction to prosecute Mutt for homicide. Finally, offenders who are out of state but attempt or conspire to commit an offense in Texas are subject to Texas criminal law. Again, again, Texas criminal law applies to offenders within Texas who attempt or conspire to commit an offense in other states, for example, internet fraud. Um, the effect would be far-reaching, not just in Texas. And then Texas criminal law would also apply to failure to provide a legally required duty within Texas, although the person is located outside Texas. In one case, the Texas court ruled that it had jurisdiction over a Colorado resident who, fa who failed to pay child support for an offspring who resided in Texas. Okay, that brings us to the end of um, that brings us to the end of chapter one. Uh, let me just stop this. I hope you learned a lot from this class. Thank you so much for you know go, for watching this video. If you have any questions, please free feel free to email me at claire.nolasco at amusa.edu. And please do your homework assignments, your look at the class schedule. And um, good day to all of you.